Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I'd like to introduce our MC, First Vice Commander Brian English will be taking charge of the ceremony. He is also our guest speaker. Um, I'll turn it over to him right now. It's Paul LaPierre here. I'm going to ask that uh, Pastor Bruce, if you could please open us in prayer, sir. Uncover. Cover. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we do not have a PA, so if you can't hear me, please raise your hand. <laughs> but thank you, everyone that's coming. We're here today to honor all those who served in the one of the longest war that we've ever fought, the Vietnam War. And we're here to honor each and every one who was in a part of that war. I have a few words today that I'm going to present in tribute. They were baby boomers raised in America of God, country, and apple pie. They were, in the words of Don McLean, a generation lost in space. America called to these sons and daughters in a time of great turmoil to serve in a land most Americans had never heard of, Vietnam. They served in a war that few wanted, many opposed vigorously, and returned often to contempt from the very people they served. Many of them, during the war, dealt with the seemingly endless loss of comrades lack of support from politicians and much of the general public with a phrase repeated countless times in country. It was the phrase, don't mean nothing. Repeated countless times throughout the war in the Mekong Delta, the Aisha Valley, Da Nang, Khe Sanh, and everywhere they served, it became a mantra. A soldier, marine, or airman's way of expressing the inexpressible, a way of dealing with senseless loss in a war started by politicians based on lies. The origins and causes of the war, the lack of political will to wince once committed to war, and the failure of the American public to support the troops are a subject for another time. It is my proposal today that these deaths and the trauma did in fact matter. And perhaps, in the light of history, meant more than those who repeated don't mean nothing could ever have imagined. One of the greatest impacts that resulted from the Vietnam War was the realization that we must never commit forces without a clearly defined goals and the will to win. This was clearly manifested in the 1991 Persian Gulf War in which overwhelming force was used to devastate the enemy. Overwhelming air power was used to destroy command and control and communications. Airfields and air defense systems. Our leaders in Vietnam had their hands tied. They were not allowed to attack these targets. Also, clearly defined objectives limited the scope of the Gulf War and define what was needed to win, unlike Vietnam, where the term mission creep came into being. We, as a nation, also learned that we must never again target those who fight for our country. The responsibility for wars lies in the hands of our elected officials. It is they who must be held accountable, rather than blaming our servicemen and women. Never again should a returning veteran be advised not to wear his uniform at home. It is my sincere hope that we will always honor those who go in harm's way. As the veterans of Vietnam gray and head into the twilight of their lives, 
perhaps the greatest meaning in all of this is manifested. It is the bonds of brotherhood shared by them. It is, as in Shakespeare's Henry V, from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Perhaps, to paraphrase the broad, we may also say, and gentlemen in America now abed shall think themselves accursed that they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us. Although the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was passed August 7, 1964, formerly acknowledging the U.S. involvement in Vietnam, the fact is American advisors were authorized by President Truman as early as 1950 to assist the French in what was then referred to as Indochina. American forces remained in the country until its fall on April 30th, 1975. The U.S. presence peaked in 1968 at 549,500, a total of 2,709,918 Americans served in uniform in Vietnam. 58,220 were killed, and as of April 14, 2017, there remain 1,611 missing in action. There were 153,303 wounded in action. And I may add, including many in our presence here today. By every metric, the United States Armed Forces never lost a major battle. The much-cited Tet Offensive was in fact a disaster for the Viet Cong, who after Tet were relegated to a much lesser role to the North Vietnamese regulars. When the U.S. withdrew, South Vietnam was left in a strong position. Failing to keep the terms of the ceasefire, the NVA were massively resupplied by the Soviets and China. The United States, weary of war and embroiled in the political scandal of Watergate, refused to re-enter the fray. This assured the, fall, the quick fall of a corrupt and an inept South Vietnamese government in 1975. The American fighting men and women did not lose the Vietnam War. It was a political failure, both in the United States and in the Republic of South Vietnam. Some of the political goals at the outset of the war were, in fact, accomplished. The so-called domino theory is sadly misaligned, but there is evidence that had the United States' involvement not been in place, other nations in Southeast Asia may have fallen under communism. In a study by Brian Kaplan called The Domino Theory Reconsidered, he makes a case that U.S. intervention did stop the spread of communism. As it always has, the war in Vietnam remains controversial. Regardless of this, we owe a debt of gratitude to those who served. Airmen flew countless missions in close air support and interdiction strikes. They flew in air-to-air -air combat in F-4 Phantoms and mounted arc light strikes in B-52s along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They flew search and rescue missions in Jolly Green Giants and lit up the night sky with AK-47s known as Puff the Magic Dragon. Marines stormed the Citadel at Hue, held Khe San against all the odds, flew air support out of Da Nang. They survived bitter ambushes at the marketplace, the rock pile, and in one of the most brutal fights of the war, the first of the 9th Marines, the Walking Dead, fought five NVA battalions at Con Tien. Army soldiers of the 1st Cavalry fought in the Idrang Valley in a battle made famous by the book and movie We Were Soldiers Once and Young. In the Mekong Delta and in countless rice paddies and jungles, Army units fought. Not to be denied, the Screaming Eagles of the 101st Airborne took Hamburger Hill against all the odds. Navy forces on Yankee Station flew countless sorties during Rolling Thunder and Linebacker 1 and 2. They patrolled the endless canals and rivers and small craft and in destroyers, cruisers and battleships gave fire support along the coast and up the rivers. Coast Guard forces provided transport and crewed landing craft. They operated 26 82-foot 
patrol boats in Vietnam that interdicted Viet Cong supply by water. And the U.S. cutters Winona and Androscoggin engaged enemy trawlers and destroyed them in the largest naval engagement of the Vietnam War. Service and support personnel from all branches served as well in vital roles throughout the war. They were cooks and mechanics, electricians and welders, doctors, nurses and corpsmen. Often unsung but essential, they drove trucks, processed paperwork, and ensured that services and supply were maintained. As a nation, we owe it to these men and women to recognize them for their service. Many may have questioned why we were there, but answered their country's call. As a young boy growing up in the South during the 1960s, there was always this prayer at my church. Bless the boys in Vietnam and bring them home safely. We know that these were men and women, but in the vernacular of the day, it is perhaps fitting. Many of them were very young and unquestioning of their duty. Thank you for serving. May God truly bless those still in Vietnam, those here among us, and may He continue to keep them safe in body, mind, and in spirit. Thank you. See, I'd like to introduce the Charles S. Hatch Post 79 Honor Detail. This is not exclusive to those who died in Vietnam. We do that on Memorial Day. This is to honor every single one who served in Vietnam. Living, dead, missing in action. May I introduce the honor guard of the Charles S. Hatch Post 79 from Berwick, Maine. Thank everyone who came today. Sorry if I had to project yelling <laughs> just to try to make myself heard. But we'd like to thank everyone that's here today. Thank you to all of our veterans. And particularly today, if you served in Vietnam, raise your hand if you served in Vietnam. Thank you, gentlemen. And now we'd ask uh, Pastor Brown you could please close the ceremony with a word of prayer, please. Uncover! <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time just to pay our tribute and respect to all these men and women who served during the Vietnam War and gave their lives, many of them, and others who are here today who may have suffered uh, wounds, PTSD, what have you, in the war. But we thank you, Father, for just each one, each brave one that gave, served willingly under their country and under God in this republic. And Father, we just ask as you dismiss us this day that you're going to just bless those who remain, Lord, just touch them with your healing power and your love. We thank you today that we stand united in you. In Jesus' name, amen. That concludes our program for today. Thank you for coming. Okay, okay good morning. Uh, I'm uh, Chaplain Bruce Brown from uh, Post 5744 in South Broad, Maine, a member of the VFW there. And uh, I've been a chaplain uh, for that post about uh, 14 years now. And uh, 
I served in Vietnam as a specialist uh, in the Army, U.S. Army, in uh, 1966 and 1967. And uh, so uh, grateful that uh, God covered me through that time and I came home in one piece. But uh, I am thankful that I was able to do my service for our country and uh, just uh, thankful for the day and this ceremony and for just uh, all those that could make it to pay tribute to the Vietnam veterans, many who gave their lives. And I know I lost a classmate there. But uh, thank you so much uh, for this time. Amen. Hi, I'm Paul Amatucci. I served in Vietnam uh, briefly. I was a medical corpsman in the Air Force. I was in medical evacuation. So my job was to actually uh, land in Vietnam, uh, gather up wounded, put them back on the hospital planes, and bring them back home. So uh, that was the nature of my service. I did that several times, both flying into Vietnam and also Clark Air Base in the Philippines, uh, where we uh, stabilized the people and then brought them home. Yeah. I'm Mike Murray. I uh, live in North Berwick. Uh, was drafted in the service in May of 1968. Was flown to Vietnam in October 68, where I spent a full year. Uh, I believe, in my mind, I locked out. I was trained infantry. I uh, was, was set in with a armored cavalry unit with tanks and APCs. Uh, we secured roads and bridges between Pleiku and Dok Tho in Vietnam. It's in Central Highlands. Uh, you know, we saw a bunch of stuff, but I'm feeling I'm, uh, really lucky that I didn't come home uh, maimed or wounded real badly. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Hey, my name is Stanley Sheldon. I'm a longtime resident of Berwick, Maine. I served in Vietnam. In 1967, oops, excuse me, I joined the service in 1967, served in Vietnam for a tour and, and extended for a second tour. S in, uh, served in uh, Phu Bai and then in the Trang for a year, where I uh, was a crew member on an aircraft, we flew reconnaissance. And so I was, in a, in a, in a, that's the extent of my tour, I guess. Thank you. Name is Phil Jenks, rank HM2 Hospitalman, second class. Well, I was with the uh, Marine Force Recon, Special Forces. Uh, we were in 3rd uh, Amphibious Battalion, and we first landed and were in July, and then moved on to Quezon. That was my first tour. Uh, my second tour was in the Mekong Delta on a mobile riverine force and uh, part of uh, SEAL Team 4 and uh, another Marine Amphibious Battalion. Uh, I was supposed to serve a third tour, but they rerouted us and we ended up in Europe in the Mediterranean. That was hell, but someone had to do it. <laughs> uh, I was in for quite a few years. Uh, had to go out because I couldn't dive anymore after injury and helicopter crash. So that was my Navy time. <laughs> That's it. We did our best. Every second was a possible moment that would be your last for anybody in country. But in spite of everything, when they interviewed most Vietnam vets, everyone said they'd go back and do it again, myself included. 
We are patriots. We love our country.